relations here. So here's how we do it. And in this box, you just see some relations between velocity, the speed of light, and the index of refraction, and how we convert between delta Zs and delta Ts. That's pretty obvious. We have a schematic diagram of a laser where we have some beam inside the laser. We have some gain medium, which is this, this block right here. And a beam bouncing back and forth between the mirrors. And we're going to consider some very small section of this with with width delta z of our gain medium. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and do some accounting. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the derivation of equation 7.5.1a in your book. And if you don't have your book open while you're listening to this, it would be a good idea to do it. And essentially what we're going to try to calculate by writing differential equations is very similar to what we did for the tanks of water, but they're going to be a little bit more complicated, is to calculate the energy from photons in our system per unit time. And we're only considering some area A of this because that's the only part of the material that the beam is interacting with. So we're only considering a sort of a cylindrical region, if you will, through this gain medium that has a cross-sectional area A. And we know we have photons that either are created or destroyed through three processes. The first of those is spontaneous emission. And so let's write what we have. Well, we add one quanta or sort of photons worth of energy with energy H nu every time there's a spontaneous emission event. We know what the rate constant for that. We know we're getting A21 photons per second because that's the rate constant for spontaneous emission. And then we have a bunch of probability terms. We have the probability of a photon being emitted at the same frequency of a particular longitudinal mode. And the width of a longitudinal mode, you remember, back in chapter 6, is given by equation 6.3.6b. And so we know this delta nu term, and we know the line shape, because that's something we can measure or look up. In fact, you'll do that in class. Um, and so the probability of a photon being emitted at the, exactly the right frequency of the longitudinal mode we're talking about is given by that. The probability of the photon going in the right direction, and remember, because the photons are coming off in all different random directions here, and we want to know whether a photon is either emitted in this direction or in this direction. The probability of that is essentially a squared over 4 pi d squared, and this is basically uh, just the the area of one of the spots of the laser, and this is an approximation, divided by the area of the sphere that is essentially um, diameter d, and that's what this is, is the probability of a photon being emitted in a direction. We'll calculate this in class. The photon has a particular electric field, and there's only a 50% chance the, the photon's electric field is pointed in the right direction. I'm not going to say more about that. And the only way we get a photon is if there's an atom there that gives up its electron. And so this, let's go ahead and change this because I've made a mistake in this equation and copying it over. This should be an N2 here. Um, but the, the number of atoms that can contribute to creating a photon in this volume, delta Z, with cross-sectional area A, is just the little cylinder composed of that right there. And essentially, that's the number of atoms per cubic centimeter times the vol volume of the cylinder, which is the area times the length of the cylinder, delta Z. And so the number of atoms contributing is given by this. And this is a kind of scary-looking equation, but really everything makes sense. Uh, we can do the same type of equation if we talk about absorption. Let me go ahead and keep that 2 there. Um, where this time we're losing energy from the beam because the energy is being given up to raise the electron, and we're losing an amount of energy H nu. The photons per second now are the B21 coefficient, and that depends on the number of photons or the energy density of the photons that's, pr that's present because of our Einstein coefficients. The, the frequency dependence is exactly the same. The probability of the photon is going in the right direction is 100% or 1, because if a photon is absorbed, it's going in a direction in which it can be absorbed. Um, the polarization is also 1, since that doesn't really depend on, the absorption doesn't depend on that much at all. And the number of atoms contributing is, again, the amount in that volume, which is exactly the same. And we have a very similar looking equation for the stimulated emission, where we add one quanta, or amount of energy H nu, at a rate B21 times the energy density. Uh, probability of it being emitted at the right frequency is just the width, frequency width times the line shape. It's going in the right direction. It has the same polarization. And the volume, essentially, term 
is exactly the same. And you can sum all of these up and get a differential equation in the book, and then you can do some transformations I'll talk about in just a minute, and you end up with an equation that looks like this. And so how do we get to this equation, 7.5.1b, which is critically important for understanding how a laser works? Well, to get from 7.5.1a to 7.5.1b, we convert the energy from photons per seconds to intensity in the beam with area A by dividing by area. And so essentially we convert from a power to an intensity by dividing by A, so just divide the whole thing by A. We convert the energy density to an intensity. And remember, we talked in one of the last many lectures about converting from intensity to energy density through this equation right here. We divide both sides by the unit length, delta Z. Um, and we're going to assume operation on one longitudinal mode. Because the last thing I want to do is take into account the frequency dependence of this line shape, particularly if I have a lot of, of longitudinal modes. So what I'm going to assume is the laser operates only in one of these longitudinal modes. And so when I do that, I can only look at that one longitudinal mode and remove the frequency dependence. And that will give me 7.5.1b, um, where sigma, the stimulated emission or absorption cross-section, is given by this. Now let's take a look at this. This is a differential equation saying how the intensity, the energy per time per unit area, or power per unit area, varies as a function of z as I travel through the gain medium. It depends on the intensity that's there times the cross-section, which just incorporates the line shape and some other things. The difference in population between the upper state and the lower state and there's another term to this differential equation that has a whole bunch of constants in it, but the important thing is that this part of the differential equation, in fact, does not depend on the intensity. So this is just a constant term. And so this part, essentially, is due to the stimulated emission of the absorption, and this part of the equation is due to the spontaneous emission. And it turns out that the spontaneous emission term is very, very small when the intensity is zero because, or excuse me, it's very, very small when the intensity is large because the first term completely overwhelms it. But when the intensity is zero, this is the only thing creating photons. So it's very important to get the laser started. But once the laser gets going, it, it fades into insignificance. And if we can ignore that second term, we can obtain an optical amplification per unit length. So the rate of change of the intensity is simply the difference in population taking into account the degeneracies times the cross-section. And this comes out to be a fantastically simple equation. And we represent this term right here by gamma, which we know is frequency dependent because there's this frequency dependence of sigma coming in there. And we call this the gain. And this differential equation is extremely simple, and we know what the solution is. We know that if n2 is greater than n1, that this term right here is going to be positive. And the solution to this differential equation is just the starting intensity, and the starting intensity gain grows exponentially with distance as it travels through. However, in the other case, that the population of 2 is less than 1, which is the normal case we encounter in everyday life, because remember, it there's just not enough thermal energy around to get the electrons up to that second state. So if this term is negative, um, you come up with a negative term. And we can call this negative gamma if we want. It's exactly the same. But we don't get gain in this case. We get absorption. And in this case, you come up with an equation that looks like that, where you replace the gamma with an alpha to represent absorption rather than gain. And you recognize this is Beer's law from the last optics class. This is the classical expression for how photons are absorbed in a medium and decay exponentially. And so you see that gain and absorption are just opposite sides of one another and depend on how the states are populated. And this makes per perfect sense, because if you have more electrons in the upper state than in the lower state, as they fall down, or the probability they'll fall down is higher than they'll go up, and you get light created. If you have more electrons in the lower state than in the upper state, if a photon comes along, the probability is higher the photon will be absorbed to raise an electron up, and you get loss or absorption. And this is essentially the key expression for laser gain. This thing right here, so let me erase all of this and put a big circle around, is something you should memorize. This is something we're going to be using over and over and over again. And after all this messing around, it's nice we come up with a fairly 